Human beings are capable of horrifying, spine-chilling deeds. We've all heard of the worst evils inflicted upon innocents, and every year a new case stuns us into silence, making us wonder if there's a line humans won't cross. In this series, we're going to look at disturbing real-life crimes. This is Cold-Blooded Crimes. John Avalos Alba and Wendy Alba's marriage was nothing short of tumultuous, with alcohol abuse, unfaithfulness, and domestic violence frequently threatening to tear their relationship apart. On one fateful night in Elgin, things took a dangerous turn when John flew into a fit of rage at a local bar. In his fury, he grabbed hold of a spiked metal ball and chain, swinging it wildly as his anger continued to escalate. Though the altercation had ended by the time police arrived, they soon encountered the couple once more, this time in a high-speed car chase through the streets. It wasn't until John slammed on his brakes that the police were able to apprehend him. However, he wasn't willing to go down without a fight, aggressively resisting arrest and lashing out at the officers. Years later, in spring of 1991, John was arrested once more, this time for domestic violence. The police were called to the scene by Wendy, who was found with black eyes, red marks, and an imprint of a shoe on her back where John had viciously kicked her. During the arrest, John threatened one of the officers, vowing to seek revenge on the officer's wife and children. It was clear that this was not the first time John had violently attacked Wendy, with neighbors, friends, and even Wendy's employer testifying to the frequent sounds of screaming and the sight of Wendy with bruises and black eyes. Even John's ex-wife attested to his abusive behavior during their marriage, painting a disturbing portrait of a man consumed by violence and rage. But the anger and violence that John had displayed so far was nothing compared to the darkness that lurked within him, waiting to be unleashed. Behind bars and still dangerous. In June 1991, 12-year-old Brandy Taylor spent the night at her friend's summer party held at the home of John, the uncle of her friend. After the slumber party, Brandy accused John of taking advantage of her, the police were called and John was arrested on a charge of indecency with a child and handcuffed at the scene. Before transporting him to jail, they let John have a word with Wendy. He was expecting Wendy to help bail him out of jail, and when Wendy refused, he made a chilling threat. Wendy, you better come get me out of jail or I'll kill you. Wendy, aware of John's violent temper, decided not to help him get out of jail. She moved in with friends Robert Donoho and Gail Webb in their apartment in Allen, north of Dallas, while trying to find a women's shelter. But even from behind bars, John's grip on Wendy was unrelenting. He wrote her letters that appeared to be love notes, but upon closer inspection, revealed themselves to be sarcastic and highly threatening. What's worse is John was preparing to carry out his threats, and it was only a matter of time before he posted bail. The Deadly Rampage On August 5, 1991, after the police released John on bail, he made a purchase at a pawn shop that would change multiple lives forever. With a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol and a box of ammunition in hand, he headed to Allen, determined to find Wendy, who had failed to find safety at local women's shelters. The tension was high as John tried to force his way into the apartment, pistol in hand. Wendy and Gail did their best to hold the door shut, but their efforts proved futile as John overpowered them and entered the apartment. The air was thick with tension as he waved the pistol and cruelly taunted the two women. But his actions soon escalated from taunts to violence. He grabbed Wendy by the hair, dragged her to the doorway and beat her with the gun before shooting her. He then turned his attention to Gail, who kicked repeatedly before shooting her six times at point-blank range. It was a miracle that Gail survived, despite the trauma she had to endure, along with her young son who witnessed the horrific scene. As the chaos continued to unfold, Robert emerged from the apartment. He was on the line with the 911 dispatcher. When he saw Robert, 
he took aim and fired, missing his target by mere inches. In a panic, John fled the scene, first dumping his car at a bowling alley before carjacking a teenager and forcing him to drive into a nearby neighborhood. But it was only a matter of time before justice caught up with him. The next day, he returned to the scene of the crime and initiated a standoff with police that lasted for two tense hours. Ultimately, it was the SWAT team who ended the standoff with stun grenades and tear gas, bringing an end to John's rampage and his reign of terror. The shocking reversal of John's death sentence. The courtroom was silent as the fate of John hung in the balance. The central question in his trial was whether the murder he committed qualified as capital murder. The prosecution claimed that John's crime had all the hallmarks of a capital offense, citing the burglary he committed when he broke into Gale and Robert's apartment. The defense, on the other hand, argued that John was not committing burglary at the time of the murder. After much deliberation, the jury delivered their verdict, guilty of capital murder. John was sentenced to death in May 1992. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed the conviction and sentence in June 1995. However, an issue arose during another Texas death row prisoner's case that resulted in John's death sentence being vacated. It was revealed that Dr. Walter Quijano, who had provided testimony on behalf of the prosecution in several cases in the past, had offered racially biased conclusions, including stating that criminals were more prone to violence if they were Hispanic. This discovery prompted the Attorney General to conduct a review of all capital cases in which Dr. Quijano testified and recommended that all of their death sentences be vacated. John's case was among them, and his sentence was overturned in a shocking turn of events. A new sentencing hearing was held for John, where he testified that he did not intentionally kill his wife, claiming it was a bad reaction. He also stated that he purchased the gun on the day of the shooting as protection from a cousin. Despite these new claims, the jury decided to re-sentence John to death in March 2001. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed a sentence in April 2003. Despite numerous appeals in state and federal court, all were denied. Thus, John remained on death row, waiting for his fate to be decided, as the question of whether justice had been truly served remained unanswered. John's Final Moments John Avalos Alba's final moments on Earth were ones of profound regret and pain. The convicted murderer was executed by lethal injection in Huntsville, Texas, on May 25, 2010. As the warden asked him if he had any final words, John Alba, at 54, let out a mournful sigh. He whispered, I wish I could go back and change it, but I know I can't. With his son and daughter standing just beyond the window, John's last thoughts were for them. Just tell everyone I love them, he said. You all will be okay, I will too. But no one could have been prepared for the overwhelming sense of terror that gripped him when the lethal drugs began coursing through his veins. It was 6.19 p.m. when he was pronounced dead, leaving behind nothing but a haunting memory of lives that were irrevocably destroyed. As the execution unfolded, Brandy Taylor's parents were present as witnesses, standing in silence. Brandy Taylor was the girl whom John Alba had been accused of molesting, and her parents may have been contemplating whether justice had finally been served. In conclusion, John Avalos Alba's life ended on May 25, 2010, when he was executed by lethal injection for the murder of his wife, Wendy Alba. The trial and subsequent appeals of Alba's case exposed flaws in the capital punishment system, such as the use of racially biased testimony and the possibility of wrongful convictions. It also brought to light the impact of domestic violence on families and the individuals involved. Do you believe that justice was served in Alba's case? Is the death penalty an appropriate punishment for convicted murderers, or can a life sentence behind bars offer a chance for redemption? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more videos like this one. Until next time.